Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the inaugural King's College London Armed Forces Day Roundtable. Um, before I kick off, I just want to make everyone aware that we are recording today's session um, so that we can share this with individuals who have been unable to attend today. I'm Nicola Fear. I'm a professor of epidemiology here at King's, and I'm based within the King's Centre for Military Health Research and the Academic Department for Military Mental Health. I've been here for the last um, 16 years, and most of my work focuses on the health and well-being of service personnel, veterans, and their families. But I'm not going to talk today about my research. My role here today is to chair today's panel and facilitate the discussion. What's the purpose for this round table? So really, we want to spend the next hour talking a little bit about the Armed Forces Covenant and King's commitment to the Covenant. And we've got a number of panelists who are going to talk today about their um, own experiences, um, their experiences of being part of the military and also part of the King's community. And some of those that are going to speak today are current students. We've also got alumni, we've got members of staff. So we're, um, hopefully a, a good variety of experiences that we'll hear from. There will be the opportunity to ask questions. And so we'd invite you to use the chat function and put questions in the chat and they'll be fed back um, towards the end of the session to, to our participants. So the, this event is being held in the lead up to Armed Forces Day, which is on Saturday. And today is Reserves Day. And I'm delighted that two of our panelists are our reserves and we'll be hearing from them <clears throat> later on. So I'm now gonna hand over uh, to Professor Barr. Uh, Professor Barr is head of department uh, defense studies within the Defense Academy at Shrivenham. And he's gonna talk uh, briefly about the Armed Forces Covenant and King's commitment to the Covenant. Thank you. So uh, thank you very much, Nicola. Um, and uh, I've been asked to talk a little bit about the Armed Forces Covenant uh, and the significance of, of uh, King's uh, signing the Covenant. Um, but before I go into explain that, I'd very much like to thank uh, Nicola, uh, Winbowen and Daniel Kremen for really being the driving force behind getting us uh, to this point. So the purpose of the Armed Forces Covenant can be very simply expressed. Um, it's seen as a promise by the nation to ensure that those who serve or who have served in the armed forces uh, and their families uh, are treated fairly. Now, as I think we're all aware, in serving the nation, members of the armed forces uh, forgo some of the rights enjoyed by the rest of society. And the covenant is thus a pledge that society acknowledges and understands uh, that members of the armed forces community should be treated with fairness and respect by the society that they serve. So why might this be important? Well, the Armed Forces Covenant first really entered public consciousness at the turn of the 21st century. But of course, the relationship between the British Armed Forces and the British people is much longer. And it has to be said that Britain's relationship with its soldiers, sailors and airmen has not always been good. Um, Francis Quarles, a soldier of the English Civil War, summed it up in this way. Uh, God and the soldier, all men adore, in time of danger and not before. When the danger is past and all things righted, God is forgotten and the soldier slighted. So these attitudes persisted for many years and put bluntly, British society has often really only cared about the armed forces and its people uh, during times of crisis. The 20th century marks a real revolution in these attitudes uh, with the foundation of the British Legion in the aftermath of the First World War. Uh, and the Legion is actually celebrating its centenary uh, this very year. Uh, the Royal British Legion has worked consistently over this century uh, to remind the public of the debt owed to servicemen and women. And of course, today, there are many uh, charities and organizations working to assist 
the armed forces community. So the armed forces covenant thus represents a modern and a very real statement of intent that Britain will respect and treat fairly its armed forces community. And the covenant focuses on helping uh, our members of the armed forces community to have the same access to government uh, services and other services as any other citizen. This includes uh, access to having a home, access to healthcare, financial assistance, starting a new career uh, and education. And that pledge is now fulfilled by many different organisations uh, and groups that are committed to making a difference for the armed forces community. Signatories include central and local government, the armed forces themselves, business, charities, uh, and educational institutions. So the covenant may not be legally binding, but it's nonetheless taken very seriously by its signatories. And this is uh, one of the reasons why uh, King's has become uh, very interested uh, in becoming a, a, a signatory of the covenant. King's has a powerful strategic vision uh, to make the world uh, a better place by serving the needs and aspirations of society and the wider world. And through this, King's has a real commitment to the service of society and the signing of the military covenant is but a part of that, but a clear demonstration uh, of that commitment and that vision. But King's also has a very long association with the armed forces. Uh, not only was the college founded by the Duke of Wellington, but its Department of Military Science was first established in 1845, uh, 173 years ago. Uh, King's more contemporary associations perhaps begin with the formation uh, of the War Studies Department, which will celebrate its 60th anniversary next year. And through the Defence Studies Department, King's possesses a unique academic military partnership uh, in professional military education. The King's Centre for Military Health Research, the Conflict and Health uh, Research Group and the Department of Military Mental Health are all highly significant endeavours which make a powerful connection between King's expertise in medicine and health and their military dimensions. So given these connections, it's only right that King should become a signatory to the Armed Forces uh, Covenant. And uh, as Nicola has said, uh, today in this week of the Armed Forces Day, we're marking King's signing of the Armed Forces Covenant. But I'm also delighted uh, to be able to, to say that as of an hour ago, uh, we learned that King's uh, has now been award, uh, awarded uh, a bronze award uh, in terms of the employer recognition scheme. And that in a sense marks some of our ambition. Uh, the employer recognition scheme has bronze, silver and gold awards uh, for organisations that pledge, demonstrate and then advocate support to the armed forces uh, community. Uh, and having moved from signing the covenant to a bronze award, we very much want to see Kings move smoothly towards a silver and eventually a gold uh, armed forces covenant award. That will require Kings to make real changes, uh, recognizing the status of armed forces personnel, whether staff or students, making firm commitments to honor leave commitments uh, and uh, enabling training opportunities for serving members, reservists, uh, and ensuring that no armed forces people or their families uh, are disadvantaged due to their service. Given King's long association with the armed forces and the college's powerful vision to work in the service of society. Uh, it's absolutely right to make these commitments uh, and we will now be working to turn that intent into reality. Thank you uh, and back to Nicola. Thank you. Um, well, thank you for that um, introduction to the Armed Forces Covenant and Kings and I definitely learned uh, about the history of Kings there. So thank you for that and yes, we're incredibly pleased um, and delighted to be awarded um, the bronze award by the Defence Employer Recognition Scheme um, and as you've heard we will be working further towards our silver and gold commitments over time. So now we're going to move on to our panellists. Um, I've asked them each to kind of talk 
briefly about for about five minutes about their kind of experiences of being part of military and um, the King's community. Um, we're going to uh, start off with Sean Taylor Byrne, Bernie. Um, I'm afraid we've got a few technical challenges and Sean is un currently unable to turn his camera on, um, but you'll be able to hear him even if, if you can't see him. Um, so Sean is a serving captain in the Royal Army Medical Corps. He's actually been part of King's since uh, 2016 when he joined us as an honorary research fellow within, uh, within the King Center for Military Health Research and the Academic Department of Military Mental Health. Um, and Sean is currently undertaking an MSc in mental health and nursing here at King's. So he's in a unique position with being uh, an honorary staff member, a current student, and also a serving member of the armed forces. So Sean, over to you. Thanks, Nicola, and hello, everyone. Um, yeah, sorry about the camera. Yeah, no, I, uh, Nicola, that's right. I do have a bit of a vantage point on this from being a student um, and a staff member and a serving member all at the same time. And I suppose the first thing to say really is when I heard of um, the Armed Forces Covenant being signed, I was overjoyed. It was absolutely fantastic news. Um, but I suppose like all good military planning and reflection, the next question you ask is, what is the so what of that document? Um, and I think that's maybe something just as an introductory comment I could reflect on. And I, I really at the basic level for me, from my experience as a staff member and student and uh, armed forces member is that we have to recognize, especially in London, that there is perhaps a slight stigma about serving in the armed forces. Um, I think back when we were all going to work, uh, we simply couldn't wear our uniform in our capital city to go up to Denmark Hill. Uh, it was just not unsafe to do so. I did once and I was heckled three times, I think, by members of the public before I even got to my first station. Now, of course, I haven't had anything like that from Kings, but it was a bit of a perspective change when I joined as a student because I noticed a bit of frostiness um, from my fellow students. They would say things like, well, look, Sean, you're, you're a lovely person. We get on very well with you. But how could you, with your positive outlook, join an organization like this? We're totally morally opposed. To. And only two weeks ago, there was a, in, in our student WhatsApp group, someone asked me about military training for nurses. And before I could even answer, uh, a student, probably joking, to be honest, um, said, just remember, quote, that the final stage of army selection is to, you know, quote, shoot an Afghan farmer in the head. Now, I'm not making a point here that I'm particularly offended by that. I think it was probably just a silly comment. But I, I think it does point to something quite interesting in the student body that there is a lot of misconceptions around about serving in the armed forces, and those really need to be dispelled. So for me, the very basic so what of the armed forces covenant is starting there. It's saying, actually, very publicly, kings corporately are very, very proud of their relationship with the armed forces, uh, past and present and future. And they want to publicize that support and show solidarity. And I think one of the things that I'd like to see is that this isn't just something that is known about in war studies department or in KCMHR where, where you have self-selected people who are very uh, pro-military. I, I would like to see from Kings a real buy-in and, and to say, yes, we are proud and, and use that as a, a, the Armed Forces Covenant as a mechanism for that to start with before we even get into some of the more day-to-day -day things that it can be useful for. But I'm sure some people disagree with that. Some people agree. Maybe we could get into it uh, later on in discussion. I'll, I'll stop there because I know you want to, to keep to time. Thanks very much. Thank you, Sean. Um, let's hope we can work on that um, <laughs> video for maybe the panel discussion. Um, so moving on to our second panelist this afternoon um, is Sarah George. Um, Captain Sarah George completed a master's in conflict resolution in divided societies here at King's. Um, Sarah's had some incredible experiences um, whilst being part of the army. Uh, I think the one that stood out to me was being the liaison officer for the military response to the Salisbury Novichok attacks. Um, so Sarah, over to you. Hi, Nicola. Um, I'm afraid I'm also going to keep my video off purely because um, we're being recorded this time, but um, hopefully I'll be able to get the message out okay via voice. 
Um, so yeah, as you mentioned, I commissioned actually into the Army Reserves in 2017, and today is Reserves Day, so it's really great to be able to talk about, you know, what people can do for the Army and the Armed Forces in terms of support, so really appreciate that we're having this discussion. Um, due to the sort of increased flexibility when it comes to career, uh, career plans for reserves and regulars, I have actually spent three years um, full-time in full-time service, and you mentioned, you know, one of my experiences down in Salisbury, which was, was fascinating. Um, but in terms of my experience at King's, so I'm sure that many, many of the King's staff and students know that it's almost a, it goes hand in hand with saying that you have a commission, that you also have some sort of degree from King's. Um, and in fact, I too went to King's um, back in 2019 to study conflict resolution and divided societies. Um, the links between King's College London and the armed forces are absolutely exceptional. Everyone Everyone there is aware of Kings, they understand what you've been studying there, they understand the, the importance that your degree will bring back to the armed forces. And I was so glad to see so many regular students being paid by the army to do their masters there, so that was really encouraging. Um, the conflict resolution masters, although now in the war studies department, was previously in the Department of Middle Eastern Studies, so it's slightly less linked to the armed forces community. However, through external speakers that we had on a weekly basis, in, in, or on a daily basis, I should really say, at KCL, and also in my optional mo modules, I was really able to engage and bring together that sort of academic focus with that military focus. Um, and one example that I, I really like is that we had... Um, uh, someone who came from NATO who was working quite senior, I'll say, I won't mention the name, um, but it was for our module in arms control that um, Professor Wynne Bowen was, was, was one of the leads for. And um, he was talking about how one of the key sort of focuses for the next five, ten years was counter CBRN capability. And as, as you know, I worked on the Salisbury Novichok case, but I also have... Um, I'm a CBRN defence advisor trained, trained with the army. And so it was really good for me to be able to discuss with him the capability of the European NATO members, um, especially looking from my point of view at the UK, but just looking across at our capabilities and sort of trying to understand how that fits in with the NATO vision that, you know, CBR, counter CBRN will be a focus. So having a conversation like that, which I can then take back and use either in the reserves or, you know, whatever full-time regular post I might be taking up, using that experience and understanding of the more strategic level point of view, which as, as, as a junior officer you don't often get, was incredibly helpful and incredibly unique. And I could only have got that via either attending sort of external lectures, but actually being able to speak to someone in a small classroom with only five or six people or students was, was amazing. Um, in terms of King signing the Armed Forces Covenant, um, while I was studying, we had the horrible um, corona situation. It was obviously, as everyone knows, we've all been living it for a number of years now. Um, but right when I was about to start writing my dissertation, we were pretty much all getting mobilised for Op Rescript, which was the military response to uh, the coronavirus pandemic. And for a student, obviously, at that point, there hadn't been the Armed Forces Covenant hadn't been signed. But as a student, understanding that King's College London has those incredible links with the armed forces and really supports the armed forces community, at no point did I ever feel very concerned that I might have to request to have my dissertation um, deadline postponed. I might have to, you know, put this back a whole year. This was never a concern of mine. I always knew that the university would 100% support me. And I think that signing the Armed Forces Covenant, if anything, just really underlines that. And any doubt that could ever be in a student's mind, hopefully, would, would be allayed by that. But in terms of the staff as well, I mean, I don't know how much of the staff at King's College London are, are serving members, but for them being able to sort of, you know, understand that they have the support of their employer when it comes to going off and working in the reserves or taking some time off to deploy is incredible. It's, it's a huge difference. And I've worked with a number of soldiers who've had their civilian employers put their foot down and say, no, we can't, we can't lose you, you can't deploy. So hopefully as you progress from bronze to silver to gold, um, making those moves into complete supporting of, of the employees and the students will be, will be an, just only a good thing. And then in terms of Armed Forces Day, I mean, every soldier armed forces day usually means a little bit of extra work so they're never too happy about it from the soldier point of view but recognizing um the efforts that they do i think is really important and i don't know if king's currently does something for armed forces day but but having some sort of ceremony or, or recognition lunch or dinner or something like that i think would be incredibly appreciated and as a uh, um, my colleague before me mentioned 
it is it is tough in London. It is scary walking around in uniform. We don't do it alone. We're discouraged for doing it. And it's, incre- it's incredible that in your own country, in your own capital city, you can't do that. So so any opportunity we have to gather as a, as a team, as a cohort and strengthen those links together and recognise what we've done is, is actually really appreciated. Um, and um, yeah, I look forward to any questions that you might have. And apologies again about the camera. Thank you, Sarah. And I hope by um, asking you to attend today, we didn't give you extra work, so, <laughs> uh, but we really appreciate your contribution. Um, so our third panelist this afternoon is Air Vice Marshal Rich Withnell. Uh, Rich is currently Director of Defence Healthcare um, and he's also a Professor of General Practice and Primary Care. So. What's Richard's connection with King's? Um, so Rich undertook the Advanced Command and Staff course um, back in uh, 2007, 2008. And he also completed an MD at King's with myself and Professor uh, Simon Wesley on the mental health of uh, the Joint um, Helicopter Force. Um, Rich has got many strings to his bow, um, the one that and many roles that he uh, plays. And the one that jumped out at me from uh, reading his um, bio was that he's honorary surgeon to Her Majesty the Queen. Um, so um, yeah, I look forward to hearing about any uh, operations that you've performed uh, on the Queen. So Rich, over to you. Uh, hi Nicola, good afternoon. Thanks very much. I have to, uh, I'm afraid, play uh, clinical confidentiality on the last question, I think. Uh, but good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so yeah, my name's Rich Withnell. Uh, I'm very privileged to be the Director of Defence Healthcare, uh, and I'm also a member of the Defence Medical Services Senior Leadership Team. Um, so what does that mean? Uh, it means I'm responsible for the delivery of safe and effective military healthcare, and I also look after the healthcare optimization programme, uh, that's our aim to improve clinical outcomes, deployability and better value for money. And Cortisone, which is going to be our new uh, next generation military health informatics capability. Uh, I'm also really privileged to be responsible for the Defence Medical Rehab Centre at Stamford Hall. So what does all that mean in the context of, of my relationship with King's? Well, as Nicola said, um, I suppose I'm the dinosaur of the group so far in that I became a student at King's in 2007, uh, when, as she said, I was doing the ACSC at Shrivenham. So with the support of both the War Studies Department, uh, specifically Stu Griffin, and with Nicola and Professor Simon and Lisa Huller and others at KCMHR, we were able to unpack for the first time stress and resilience issues amongst members of the Joint Helicopter Force, so operational military air crew. The experience that King's brought to bear and the ability to access a world-leading longitudinal cohort study database meant that that research went really well. Uh, I was very fortunate to win both the ACSC Defence Research Paper and the MA Prizes, but more importantly than that, the research done through King's informed MOD operational stress management policy and it influenced operational flying patterns in Afghanistan. As Nicola said, that then grew into an MD, uh, which is a sort of clinical PhD, if you like, in psychological medicine at King's that was awarded in 2013. And I'm sure that that step with the support of King's is why I, I was able to become the RAS first defence professor of general practice and then uh, the first GP to become the medical director. So uh, Nicola, as you were my primary supervisor for both the MA and the MD, I'll always owe you a specific debt of gratitude, um, but that gratitude extends to King's more broadly. So I was absolutely thrilled uh, when I heard that King's had signed the covenant as a continuing sign of their commitment to work with the military, because as my experience shows, this isn't anything new, this has been happening for a very long time. But Kings have now very kindly committed to continue to take consideration for the unique requirements of the armed forces. As Nile touched on at the beginning, that the covenant is a promise by the nation to support armed forces communities. And 10 years on since the inception, it continues to put great emphasis on our people. My so what of King's signing is that we know that the majority of colleagues who leave the armed forces transition really well into civilian life. But we also recognise that that isn't always the case. 
And I think we must work in unison to continue to ensure that former service people who do face challenge receive the very best support and consideration that they need and that they deserve. And therefore, I think that the mental health research, especially that King's undertakes, is really key to helping us as the military, but also our NHS colleagues, to better understand the specific needs of current and former service personnel and their families. So why is Armed Forces Day so special to me? Well, I think it's great that we can celebrate King's signing on Reserves Day and in the week of the annual Armed Forces Day. It's important to me because our armed forces are world class and they help to protect the UK and that's been writ large in COVID. The armed forces, I believe, are value members of society because we're professional, we're inclusive and we're diverse and reserves are absolutely central to our armed forces family. So in Armed Forces Week and on Reserves Day, I think events like this roundtable are really useful in connecting communities, including universities and other academic and educational bodies with the armed forces to help inform people about who we are, what we do and how we support the nation. So more broadly, in my view, I think King's is a standout academic institution with whom I personally feel the Defence Medical Services are very proud to partner. Obviously, you're ranked in the top 10 universities in the world and King's prolific military mental health outputs not only inform us as MOD, but I know from first hand they influence NATO and they deliver world changing ideas and life changing impact. So, Nicola, thank you very much to you and the wider King's team for the opportunity to speak to you this afternoon. I'm really grateful for our collaboration with you and I look forward to it continuing long into the future. Thanks very much indeed, Nicola. Back to you. Thank you. And thank you for those kind words, Rich. Um, so our fourth speaker this afternoon is uh, Major Giles Moon. Uh, Giles joined the army back in 2010. Um, and in 2012, he deployed to Afghanistan and was a mentor to the Afghan National Police in Helmand. He's since then completed a number of other tours to Afghanistan, Iraq, Jordan, um, as well as holding down policy positions uh, within uh, main building in Whitehall. Um, he was selected back in 2018 uh, for the Army's Academic External Placement Scheme and came to King's to read for an MA in International Relations. Um, um, and we're delighted that he was able to take time out today uh, to join us. So, Giles, over to you. Thanks very much, Professor. So uh, probably should just set my my background out. So I, I came, the Army sort of generously funded me, I'm a full-time Army officer in the Army, so generously funded me through what's known as the External Placements Academic Scheme, where we send a few people on master's degrees every year to help broaden, uh, to give people a chance to, to think um, and to, to study sort of related to, to our profession. And I was pretty lucky to be able to do that at KCR, which is I would argue the best place to do that probably in the world, really, because uh, some of the people you get exposed to, some of the, the studying that goes on and, and some of the work that's happening. Um, and in the unlikely event that anyone from, from my era of the armed forces is watching this, I recommend uh, getting onto that programme. Uh, but it was, no, it was, I had a great year. I had a chance to study under, um, be supervised by Simon Anglim, I think is, is on this call. So I will say only nice things about him. Um, but I studied the use of Russian conventional force and when Russia moves from the kind of grey space, grey zone operations we see primarily into conventional operations. And that was a, a useful piece of work that's helped me sort of think my way through some of the, the stuff we've seen recently um, operationally. And, and in fact, we are only a few hours uh, past Russia saying that they have um, fire warning shots at a British ship in uh, the Black Sea, which appears not to be true, but is nevertheless uh, shows how topical some of the work going on at KCL is. Um, and I know I'm, I'm meant to be talking in some ways about um, how, you know, how great it is that, that King's has assigned the Armed Forces Covenant, what that means. But in many ways, I think it's actually primarily there as a, as, um, as a signal rather than anything particularly meaningful. Um, it's, it's great to show the intent of signing the Armed Forces Covenant, but I think from having from my experience at King's, I think KCL is already really good at supporting uh, the Armed Forces and it, it does more than almost anyone else uh, or any other organization I've come, I've come across in terms of supporting and working with the Armed Forces. Clearly you have an entire Defence Studies Department working down at Shrivenham, um, sort of helping the Armed Forces sort of study and, and learn. But actually my experience at KCL was extremely positive. I was given time off uh, routinely to when I needed to go back into work. 
Uh, there was a period towards the end of my studies where rather than uh, doing my dissertation, I was deployed to Jordan, uh, slightly unhelpfully. And Kate were brilliant at, at letting me delay, letting me take take time to complete my dissertation and then you know, for helping me through that process thereafter. And actually, I've, I've also been invited, generously invited back by um, by, by Simon Anglip since to, to help teach and help um, explain to some of the students about how military planning works to help them with some of their studies as well. So I think ultimately King's has already very good, very established links to the armed forces. And what I think is, is brilliant to see uh, the armed forces covenant signed as sort of symbolic value. But I think in many ways, we're, we're, so, we're most of the way there in terms of um, the commitment to service personnel and the commitment to sort of helping the armed forces be as good as they can be in the service of the nation. So no, I, I think thank you very much for your work on it and for everyone else who's done work in the background. But I think overall, KCL is in a brilliant place and it's just great to see that continue. Thank you, Charles. Oh, now I can't get my camera to work. Oh, yeah, <laughs> another IT challenge. Um, so our fifth uh, panelist this afternoon is Lance Corporal uh, William Fletcher. Um, he joined the Army Reserves in 2009 so happy Reserves Day, uh, Will. Um, and at the same time as uh, joining the Army Reserves, he also joined King's as an undergrad um, where he um, studied um, war studies. Um, and from reading uh, Will's uh, bio, he's actually been part of King's and part of the Reserves ever since. Um, he stayed at King's and completed an NMA. Um, before moving to a defense studies department for his PhD. And in 2020, uh, Will was appointed a lecturer within the defense studies department. Um, so uh, Will is um, now a member of staff, uh, but is also serving within the reserves. So Will, over to you. Great, thank you very much, um, Nicola. And um, yeah, great news about uh, the award to Kings and generally this event for um, recognising uh, the military covenant and its importance and uh, relationship with Kings. As you mentioned, since 2009, um, I've sort of, from the moment I sort of left school um, until now, I've always been involved in both the Army Reserve and Kings. So um, very, uh, two major links, both through sort of undergraduate and then postgraduate study. And now as a member of staff um, at the Staff College, um, it's both those strands have been running um, for the last sort of 12 years. So um, it's been um, really, they've gone hand in hand for all of that time um, and a number of sort of different perspectives I've had, I think. Um, firstly, it's been good for me to have the sort of two careers really running um, side by side and, and the Army Reserve sort of allows that where some of my friends um, that went into the regular army obviously haven't been able to carry on as I have in sort of academia. So um, there's a major advantage of the Army Reserve um, and also for me personally working for Kings it's been good um, to have exposure to um, military culture and um, you know going on different courses or going on different exercises with different units and building up contacts um, and just understanding the military culture has, has been really useful for me um, as a student and then as a member of staff um, to really have an insight into how the military works um, which some of my colleagues um, perhaps don't have as much so I think it's and um, really interesting uh, to be able to get an insight into the military um, as an academic. Um, in terms of reflection on what's of what the um, covenant means to me, I think um, as Neil sort of started off at the beginning of the um, event, I think, I mean, from a military historian's perspective, I very much feel that there's kind of always been a military covenant um, or an agreement. It's just been informal in the past. And obviously society and the armed forces have always had um, a relationship um, and an agreement, but the Armed Forces Covenant now really actually formalizes that um, and recognizes that two-way um, commitment um, more in a, in a formal way, in a written way. So I think that's really crucial um, and really helps Army Reservists like me in terms of when it comes to needing extra leave, um, et cetera, or um, you know, going away on courses as a student, I was able to have time off um, to spend two weeks doing a course um, and hopefully and that may sort of continue to be the case now that uh, I'm a member of staff and um, sometimes needing perhaps extra time off, which I know um, my Army Reserve Regiment, for example, is in the City of London um, and various friends of mine who are in um, you know, fairly big um, corporations in the city 
and that them signing up to the armed forces covenant has been really beneficial to them and because it, their workplace has really recognized the importance of um, what they're doing in the army reserve but also given them extra time um, off to go and do extra courses which didn't exist before they'd signed the military covenant so they found it sort of really useful um also, I mean, has already been mentioned, but I think King's reputation um, in the armed forces is already very strong. And um, obviously here at the Staff College, Defence Studies is um, a King's you know, department. Um, and I think across the army, it's well recognised. Um, but signing the covenant really means it's much more of a two way process that not only is King's helping to educate the army, but um, people like myself that are, are in the army as well. Um, hopefully King's will sort of start to recognise the importance uh, that uh, military experience has and giving time off or recognizing that um, is clearly very important um, and yeah I think just generally um, the links between the military and kings run deep there's a number of um, friends of mine that all we all studied war studies as undergraduates together um, and many of them are still in the army same army reserve regiment I'm in um, out of the 16 of us in our small part of the regiment um, six of us are all war studies alumni so um, I think across the army um, you know, some similar patterns may emerge in terms of regular officers who know each other, went through Santos. And so um, there's certainly a large swathe of people that are alumni of King's, and um, perhaps more so than some other universities, and um, that then go out into the military world. And I think um, King's signalling that they're supporting that and supporting the armed forces is really important. Um, and signing the covenant um, is a major, major part of that. Um, but yeah, those are just my thoughts. Um, and I'll hand back to you, Nicola. Thank you very much. Thank you, Will. So our final panellist this afternoon, well, actually, before I introduce our final panellist, can I just say after we've, after Keisha has said a few words, we will kind of be happy to take questions and comments from um, the audience. So if you do have a question or a comment, um, please do put it in the chat and we'll pick that up. Um, if it's directed at a particular panellist, please, you know, indicate that. Um, but if it's for all panelists, then we'll um, we'll we'll ask accordingly. Um, so our final panelist this afternoon is Keisha Colton Palmer. Um, someone else I need to say happy Reserves Day to. Um, so Keisha is a reservist, um, four years of service, um, and she's currently a combat HR specialist. Um, but also, whilst being a reservist, she is completing an MSc here at King's in the Institute of Psychiatry uh, in, the, in war, and, war and Psychiatry. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful that Keisha has been able to join us this afternoon. Um, so Keisha, over to you. Thank you very much. So as Nicola said, I'm uh, currently a full-time student at KCL studying war and psychiatry. Uh, and that course covers things like uh, the history and development of psychology and psychiatry throughout the military, um, how civilians are affected by um, the military, war, uh, natural disasters, the effects of natural disasters, and also combat-related disorders. Um, so I decided to applied to King's because of their relationship with the armed forces um, and that's kind of what I want to go into. So I have been serving as a reservist for four years now. Um, as was said, I'm a combat HR specialist, which is just a fancy way of saying I'm a clerk. Um, I also deal with the G1 welfare side of things. So I assist the welfare officer within the unit. Um, any situations that I can aware of, we just pass it on and discuss it. And my academic background is I studied an undergraduate in psychology and master's in psychology. And I covered topics such as um, anxiety and stress, uh, clinical neuroscience and so on. And I did all that because um, my aspiration is to become a clinical psychologist within the military, which is kind of a gray area, or at least assisting. So as a civil service um, individual, so once I qualify as a clinical psychologist, hopefully in a few years, then I'll look at um, hopefully commissioning through the PQL route and then seeing what happens there. Uh, my experience with King's, I joined King's in 2020. So um, I only had a few face-to-face -face lessons before COVID um, came and everything went online. So 
the social side, not so much, but um, the academic side. So as I mentioned, you've got KCMH, which is why King's was interesting to me. Also, I'm lucky enough to have Nicola as my uh, dissertation supervisor, and she's been brilliant with sort of networking. So some of the other panelists on this call, I've actually had the chance to discuss with them um, some things, so that's been great. And also the research opportunities, especially within the armed forces, it's, it's endless because they do great work. Um, yeah, so my experience with Kings is, is good, but also limited because of the, the current situation. Um, but I, I, I think King signing the AFC is a great step towards, obviously we have the recognition already, but a step towards development within civilian um, population and also the military and being able to come together and make things better for everybody. For example, um, it gives potential for the integration of service personnel or veterans into civilian population, it, it sort of eases that because you have you have sort of like resettlement programs in pro, in in position, which has already been discussed, and there are things there. But I do know a lot of people do actually struggle coming from what a lot of people refer to as the simple life, mainly in regular service, to then come into civilian life. And they find it difficult just to adapt, especially not everybody. There's so many people, not everybody has that support network. So making relationships such as um, what Kings are doing with AFC, it, it, it gives everybody a step closer to making that support network for people when they leave the armed forces and giving them the information they need to then move on and also be successful with the next steps they take in their life. Um, and for me, the importance of Armed Forces Day is it, it, it's it, it's quite important because it gives people the recognition. Um, it also shows the appreciation for what they do because they do work hard. And in addition to that, it's kind of like a morale boost and everybody needs that every now and then. Um, and also it, it pushes people to be proud of the work they've done. And especially with the, the recent work that the Armed Forces have done with the Opry script and stepping up um, during COVID times, they, they've shown a lot of a, a great ability to adapt and that's what we should be known for, the ability to support and adapt instead of sort of like the misconceptions that have been discussed previously by everybody. But um, yeah, I'm really happy with the um, new relationship which is being put together. Thank you, Keisha. So um, I'm going to hand over to, to Wynne Bowen to make a few closing remarks. Um, for the, I'm sure most of you will know Wynne, but Wynne is the head of school for security studies um, here at King. So Wynne, um, the final few moments are, are all yours. Well, thanks, Nicola. I think, right, you know, you're handing the baton over to me to actually get the time all wrong and go over the hour, which I'll inevitably do now. <laughs> so many thanks, Nicola. So Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's been humbling this afternoon to listen to uh, the personal reflections and experiences of our you know, King students and colleagues, both past and present, uh, who are members of both the King's community and also the Armed Forces uh, community as well. And I'd like to say many thanks indeed to all of the panelists for taking the time out today to participate in this important event uh, for King's. People are very busy, I know, so we are very thankful. And a huge thank you too to Nicola for chairing uh, of course, a uh, sterling job and to our comms team, Lizzie and Aisha, for all the fantastic support as ever. King's um, prides itself uh, on being uh, a, an organisation that's committed to being inclusive. Uh, and the Armed Forces Covenant uh, and the commitments that it entails for King's, I think, fits squarely with that priority that we place on inclusion at King's. In the end, this is all about looking after our students, looking after our colleagues, and um, just it's about doing the right thing. Uh, it's fantastic news that we've got a bronze award to come through today uh, and that will clearly spur us on uh, uh, for the silver and the gold um, awards in due course. Three points actually stood out for me in the discussion this afternoon. Uh, the, the, first, the first point that really stuck in my mind was, was, the, was the positive aspect around King's is doing all right uh, already uh, before we'd signed the covenant. I think that's positive, it's nice to hear. But two other things that I think um, really struck me 
was this first this issue about the misperception of the armed forces uh, in some parts of, of the student body? Um, I think that is the case. I think that that is correct, absolutely. Um, and then the second aspect too was that London is a challenging place to be uh, serving in the armed forces sometimes. So I think these these two issues are, are really important. And I think these are things that we can seek to look at and better understand and address um, within the armed forces steering group, uh, which Nicola and I chair. So I think those are the three sort of key takeaways that, 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 that I've got from today, uh, along with other things too. So we're very keen with the King's uh, Armed Forces Covenant steering group to hear from anyone who's interested in uh, contributing to the implementation of the Covenant of the Kings. So please do get in touch with Nicola or myself or other members um, of the steering group if you'd like to do that. We'll have events like this um, and other activities going forward, of course, and the more people we involve, um, the more I think we will live up to and exceed uh, the college's commitments under, under the Armed Forces Covenant. We're particularly interested in bringing on board student representatives and we will put some communications out about that um, in due course. So I will I'll leave my comments there. Many thanks again to our speakers um, and to the chair um, and to our comms team for helping pull this all together. Um, it's been a really interesting event, very important uh, and very, very insightful for me in terms of, of, of hearing the various comments uh, from our panelists. So I wish everyone a good remainder of the day and uh, a restful evening. <laughs>